So welcome to Easy Energy Efficiency Now. I am Stacy Hill with the City of Salem. I'm the um, in Outreach and Engagement Coordinator uh, with the Sustainability and Resiliency Department. Today's presentation will focus on the things you can do right now at home. Nothing too difficult. Uh, you don't have to put in a whole lot of effort for this, but just to make your home more efficient so that you use less energy and can be more comfortable. Um, so Christine from Hortz Energy will be presenting first. They are a mass save partner. There are many of those um, in Massachusetts. So if you have National Grid or Eversource or others as a supplier, it's not a municipal light company, they participate in mass save and you can actually get a no cost home energy assessment and then hopefully get the weatherization work that's recommended done. So that's the- Or if you have gas. Or if you have gas, yes, definitely. So important to invite. Right. Um, and the second part of the presentation will be about a nifty technology. It's not exactly new, but you might not have heard of it before. It's called induction and induction stove. And I actually do have, oh Andy, I do have a, little portable unit that we can play with afterwards. So I will leave it to Christine. Thank you. Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Christine. As Stacy said, I am with Homeworks Energy. Um, I'm here today to talk about basically how residents can become more energy efficient and sustainable in the home. Um, I am currently a business development coordinator and I was also a former brand ambassador for the company. So a lot of my day-to-day -day role uh, was to talk to local community residents and to inform them about the NASA program and about the resources they have um, at their disposal. So before I begin talking about, I guess, the details or what we offer, I wanted to talk a little bit about the company itself. Um, we were founded in 2012. We are currently the largest home performance contractor that is partnered with the Mass Save program. We have over 600 employees statewide, which help us to serve all of Massachusetts, which is great. And we hope to serve them in a time efficient manner because there are millions of residents that need our help right now. Um, we also, in 2022, have performed more than 32,000 home energy assessments, more than 14,000 weatherization projects, as well as over 2,000 HVAC installs. So what we do is we basically, we're um, under the Mass Save umbrella, but we mainly serve homes that are one to four family properties, as well as residents that have um, National Grid, Eversource, or Kate Light utilities. The Mass Save program itself also serves multi-families that are five plus units um, as well as commercial businesses. Our company itself mainly does the residential properties but if you were interested in multi-families, five plus units and commercial um, and renovations and things like that you can contact Mass Save directly and they can provide you with a contractor that will help you with that. So what drives us? Um, our mission basically is to simplify energy efficiency for residents. We want to try to make it as easy as possible for people to reduce their energy usage. Um, since 2012, we've saved more than 2.9 million metric tons of CO2 from entering the atmosphere. To put that into perspective, that is like planting 77 million new trees and letting them grow for 10 years. So it is definitely making a huge impact. Maybe not day to day, we don't see it, but over the span of several years, we're seeing a huge difference. Um, and then this is just a picture of our one of our five core values, always getting better, inspiring customer confidence in this together, positive homeworks energy and making a difference. So a little bit more detail about uh, what we offer. We offer the home energy assessments, which you can sign up for every few years, every two years if you have Eversource, every three if you have National Grid. These are offered by uh, the utility companies, by the program for no cost to residents. And it's a very easy way to just get your home checked up for safety issues, 
for gas leaks, carbon monoxide leaks, or just to check up on your insulation and see how efficient your home is. Um, we also offer weatherization as... Yes? I might ask you a question. Okay, yeah. So I think it's important for people to know that there's no cost because every electric and gas bill has a line item. And National Grid Ever Source and the Gas Companies are required by law to do an energy efficiency program, which is the assessment. Yes, exactly. So the massive program is state mandated, which is why the utility companies are even doing something like this. So all the residents who have like energy, like Eversource and National Grid, they do have that energy charge. I think it's called the energy efficiency charge. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. So, so they have gas, they charge on the gas bill as well. They pay for okay, yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> Well, even more reason to take advantage of the energy assessment. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so all of those help to fund the program and in turn help to fund these projects for the residents. Um, but yeah, so after someone would get an energy assessment, they could uh, choose to get weatherization done if it's approved for their home. Weatherization includes insulation as well as air sealing. Depending on the type of home you have, if you're a single family and get approved, you can get up to 75% off insulation uh, and 100% off air sealing. If you're a landlord, let's say, and you get your whole building checked up, it, you can get basically 100% off of insulation and air sealing. Three family or more? Three family or more? It's, it's actually, for in some cases, it's as long as it's multifamily, okay. double okay. or more. Yeah. So. I don't know if it's by city, but I'm pretty sure uh, any multifamily is eligible. And for HVACs, heating, ventilation, and cooling, we offer installs for those as well as energy efficient options that I will mention a little bit later. So in particular, we are in partnership with uh, Beverly and Salem. Um, we're one of the HPCs or home performance contractors with the city. And in 2022 of spring, we launched the Beverly Salem Challenge, basically helping residents get informed about the program, sign up for energy assessments, and reducing carbon emissions. So since 2022, we've completed over 14,000 energy assessments, as well as nearly 500 weatherization projects. It's also a good thing to note that in these uh, particular cities or towns, we are able to serve residents of all income levels, which we previously were not able to do, but we are now rolling out a model that can serve those people, which is extremely helpful. We, right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, so I'm going to rephrase it. Tell me if it makes sense. Sure. So people who are on fuel assistance, they get a discounted rate on their electric bill or gas bill or both. Yes. Uh, you will now, uh, homeworks will now be able to do an assessment for that, right? Exactly, because we have now started working with the cap agencies themselves that provide the fuel assistance and discounts to give them the assessment. So that's why it's been taking a while to like roll mm -hmm. it out statewide. Um, but yeah. And so that's any. Home performance contractor can work with the low income. Um, it's it's just, just homeworks, and then it's case by case basis on depending on the performance contractor. Only about ten percent of the ones who do one to four units uh, qualify to to do income eligible. It's not income eligible. If you're on fuel assistance, okay. So fuel assistance. Is it always a specific income level? Yeah. It has a lot of things attached to it. You can be on Social Security or whatever. But if you're on fuel assistance, there's only a small percentage of companies that do both. Mm -hmm. And it used to be, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you're on fuel assistance and you want to get an energy assessment, sometimes you've got to wait two or three years mm -hmm. because very few uh, agencies were, were um, licensed. Yeah. yeah, so basically it's kind of hard to do the assessments for either on fuel assistance or income eligible because it's 
we follow a completely different, I guess, infrastructure. We work with the CAP program or agency instead of just the regular mass save program. And not all companies or performance contractors do that. But yeah. Um, and then, so we also help provide um, informational materials in Spanish or other languages. We recently also have a translation service. So if you call our company and need to speak with someone in your native language, you can call us and we can translate as well. Okay, so this slide is basically for combustion safety. This is one of the most important aspects of the home energy assessment. Uh, one of the reasons why we recommend you do the assessment every few years is so that someone can check for basically the combustion safety of your heating system. We don't want anything to blow up. Um, we check for air pressure. We make sure that there are no gas leaks or carbon monoxide leaks, um, either in your boiler, furnace, um, your hot water heater, or your gas stove. So for weatherization, this is just some examples of different types of insulation you might see in your home or that we can check for. The pink substance or materials here is fiberglass. The textured gray ones are blown-in insulation. Um, we typically try to do blown-in insulation for our insulation projects. And down here, I was told these boards were a type of material similar to spray foam that you can use as insulation in the case that you can't use um, blown-in insulation to insulate. Moving right along, health and safety. This is another important aspect um, that residents can get checked uh, during an energy assessment as well. Um, and that is either if you have growing mold, knob and tube wiring, or vermiculite that could lead to asbestos. The mold and vermiculite, for obvious reasons, is not good to have in the home. It, it will cause you health issues and it's just hazardous in general. So we do have um, partners that help with remediation of all three of these things because we aren't allowed to do weatherization for homes if you have any of these problems. So we do have partners that we can refer you to to help fix these before we can basically insulate and air seal your home. Okay, so these are what we call the isms or the instant saving measures. Um, it's basically the simplest thing you can get during the energy assessment. It's completely no cost. During the assessment, they can just hand it to you as well as install it for you. We usually install the thermostats and shower heads and they can help you save money by saving electricity usage, monitoring, uh, monitoring or basically these are low flow shower heads, so they help reduce water usage. Um, something for your sink that's similar for the shower, as well as programmable thermostats that you can program to turn on and off at specific times. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Um, just a general thing, if you insulate your home mm -hmm. and get a programmable thermostat, you can save as much as 30%. Is that so? That is beautiful. I mean, this is why we like to try to do everything in conjunction because everything kind of builds on top of each other. The thermostat, the air sealing on top of the insulation, and then getting like a, a mini split or heat pump all would be incredibly beneficial. And I heard your home is very <laughs> sustainable, so you yeah. know a lot about this. And I, I we had a, one of those shower heads for probably the better part of a decade. Oh, really? They're great. The water pressure yeah. in them is good. They have different um, different settings. And the only reason we got rid of it was because when they redid the bathroom, they put in a different low flow shower. Yeah. I, yeah, I heard that from some customers, like the pressure is really good. And then for some, it's not that great. So I'm wondering if it's like due to where your house is positioned, if it's Could elevated be. or not, it might impact. Um, Okay, so this is a slide for ductless mini splits and heat pumps. So these are the heating systems that run on electricity, so you won't have to be relying on any fossil fuels. But you can also use these in conjunction with, let's say, a gas heating system. But these can heat and cool your home. We have a ductless mini split version for homes that don't have vents or ducts currently built into their home and the person doesn't want to do any major or invasive renovations like that, 
we also um, have just regular heat pumps that can be incorporated in your current um, vent and duct system. I actually know more about these. Okay, perfect. Energy assessment. Yeah. So the ductless mini splits do um, heat and air, as you said, mm -hmm. about 70% more efficient than uh, oil and gas heat, and over 330% more efficient than window air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And because each one operates independently, even though they can connect to the same outside compressor. Yeah. Um, you, you zone the whole home, mm -hmm. so it creates a lot more efficiency. You can have different temperatures, different fan speeds in different rooms, mm -hmm. and you're not using energy in a room, they are not spending time. Yes, yeah, so that is a very good point. So one of the, the points here is flexibility. So you can basically do what Beth said, zone your home. Um, you can place these in rooms that you need it versus rooms that you don't, or you can just use them when you're using this room versus not using it. And um, the central heat pump yeah. on the bottom mm -hmm. is great for people who have furnaces. Okay. So people either have boilers, mm -hmm. you know, which are pipes which run the steam, hot water through the house. But if you have a furnace which runs hot air, you can take out your cold oil or gas furnace and put it in uh, air source heat pump. Exactly. Yeah. Essential. Yes. Good. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, how many heat pumps do you have in your home? I'm sorry. How many heat pumps do you have in your home? All of them. All of them? In every uh, room? Yeah. <laughs> oh, in every so home. So I have, I have a four family. Okay. Yeah. And I have three tenants. And are you going to go over the incentives? So people, oh, right, yes. people who, who uh, convert their whole home, mm -hmm. so for every ton that you're offsetting of energy, you get a rebate. Mm -hmm. But if you do your whole home, and you don't have to remove your whole heat source, mm -hmm. but you can just say you're going to use it for emergencies, you get 10,000 volts. Yeah. So all my tenants have the air source heat pumps, the mini splits, the heat and cool their home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one unit has seven, one has four, one has three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a lot. Yeah, so about the incentives, we do, I think in some cases it's up to 15K now. It was it's up to 16,000. It's called the low income ad. Yeah, so it's yeah. a recent thing. Um, so that is a good rebate, definitely if you're looking into heat pumps. Um, we also, Homeworks Energy in particular, offer a heat loan system up to 50K. So if you didn't want to pay off the heat pump all at once, you have a seven year time span that you can pay it off for 0% interest. Um, what's good about our company is we also help the residents with all the paperwork with the rebates. So. You don't have to just struggle with that on your own. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So, I, I don't know about homework, so I'm just asking. You. Yeah. But I know the company that did mine, they actually deducted, they took the rebate. So, the installer can get the rebate. Mm -hmm. So, instead of paying a million dollars and getting, you know, a half a million back in a rebate, mm -hmm. they deducted. The rebate from the pump. You know, if you guys do that, is that a good way of uh, yeah. people not having to take that bigger pump? I think it, that was the case before. Um, we used to just take on the costs of the rebates so that they can not have to pay anything at all. But I think because we're dealing with a larger amount of money now, we don't always do that. So I'm not entirely sure what the process Sorry. is. Yeah. <laughs> but people should ask. Yes, yeah, so they should definitely ask. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So we are uh, only as good as our people. So this is just about our company. Um, we love to do what we do. We love to help people. And all the interactions we have with the residents are meaningful ones. Um, and it's all, it's a two way street. We only do so much to help outreach, but it's also the positive receptiveness of the residents that make everything worthwhile as well. Um, 
this leads to our outreach. So I said before, I was I used to be a brand ambassador, so I was basically going to events day to day, either popping up on the sidewalk in front of storefronts, going to different events. Um, we do door to door canvassing. So it was just out being in the fields, talking to a lot of different people and helping them learn about the program. And a lot of them, they didn't know about the program and a lot of them did. So it's just good to get the word out there or just to remind people. We also do digital um, direct mail referrals and we also have partnerships such as the town ones with Salem and Beverly um, and other like-minded topics. And everyone should get an assessment. And everyone should get an assessment, most definitely. And, and renters can sign up. Yeah. Renters can definitely sign up. Yeah. Did you have something to say about that? I was just going to say, renters can do the assessment on their own if they just want weatherization work. That's when they need to work with their landlord. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So they can definitely get the assessment and get the things like the power strips and shower heads, things that are not as invasive. Um, these are some of the partners that we have currently. So this is not a fully comprehensive list, um, but we have towns like Marshfield, Lexington, um, Gloucester. We have a window partner as well. A lot of people ask, we don't currently have solar partner, but we're looking to find one. But as of right now, we don't have that. But our list of town partnerships is growing every day. And so I'll just end it off um, with this. This is just some pictures of our company, team outings, things that we do together. A lot of us basically work at HomeWorks because we want to help people. A lot of the employees are directly in contact with residents and serving the community. So it's really important for us to basically do the best we can to help people. Um, yeah. This is contact. So if you have any questions, you want to look at the website, you can call that number for a company. This is actually my colleague, uh, Steven. He works directly with trying to get town partnerships. So if you have any particular questions, you can ask him and he'll direct you to um, a team in our company that can help. But yeah. Any other questions for Christine yes. before I answer the switch over? No? Okay. Good. Thank no. you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> get, yes. Get your home energy assessment. That's the one thing that you take away from this program. Is get the assessment. Basically, only costs you time because you've already paid for it on your own. Um, so, uh, we're moving on to the in hot water. Uh, the watch pot never boils, but at the end of this, I have a video where we're not only going to watch the pot boil, we are going to time it um, on a number of different heating appliances. So you can see here three different types. We've got gas, electric, and induction. You might notice something a little weird about the induction there. So uh, we'll be talking about why you might want to switch to an induction stove. How do the different types of cooktops work? Um, how is induction itself different? We do have that comparison. I don't know if we'll be able to get it on camera. Well, the comparison is like a video on here. Um, but I also have a live demo if anybody wants to play with it. At the very end, we can do that. Uh, and then, of course, time for questions and answers. So part of the reason that you'd want to not only do this, but also get your home energy assessment, part of decarbonization is making your house more efficient. You want to reduce your carbon production. And by doing, in doing that, a good way to start is reduce your energy usage by making efficiency improvements. So Weatherization will go a long way towards that. Uh, electrification is another huge part of it because if you electrify and you're not using natural gas or oil or propane, you at least have a choice of where your electric supply comes from. Whether you do Salem Power Choice and bump it up to 100% renewable, or you put solar panels on your house, or you participate in community solar, there are ways to get more clean energy onto the grid. So by electrifying your house and decarbonizing on a personal level, you're helping overall with the effort. So efficiency, uh, we're gonna talk, so a gas stove, so basically the percentage of energy that's used, that is transferred from the appliance to your food. 
Um, for a gas stove, this is only between 32 and 40 percent. For an electric coil, not terrible, uh, 75 to 80 percent efficient, but an induction stove can be between 85 and 90 percent efficient. So if you're going for efficiency, an induction stove is really your best bet. So if you look on the Energy Star website, it says that if all the cooktops sold in the U.S. used induction technology and met the Emerging Technology Award-winning Systems draft criteria, um, the energy cost savings would exceed $125 million and the energy savings would exceed 1,000 gigawatt hours, which would be enough to power 826 trips in the DeLorean time machine um, from back to the future, just to give you an idea for how much energy we could save if everybody converted just to induction stoves. And that's only one thing you can do. There are heat pump hot water heaters, heat pump dryers. There's, there are a number of other appliances you can upgrade. But for today, we're gonna focus on induction stoves because they're cool. Um, and they also help you um, get rid of one of the worst offenders in your home if you have one, which is the gas stove. So there are some risks associated with gas stoves in addition to you know, your house possibly blowing up if there are other issues that aren't even having to do with your house, but uh, they are a big contributor to indoor air pollution uh, and they contribute to climate change, not only just in your house, but there's gas leaks pretty much all over the place. They emit methane, they emit other pollutants. Um, so interesting little factoid, the levels of nitrogen dioxide. So the U.S. standard, the outdoor standard for nitrogen dioxide is 100 parts per billion over a one hour average. And it's terrible, hard to read. Um, the Canadian standard is 60. The California standard is 100. That's the outdoor standard. There are no indoor standards for nitrogen dioxide. They just don't exist. So we don't really know. I mean, in, in the home, nothing regulates that. But uh, the, at least in the U.S. So in Canada, the guidelines for one hour average parts per billion, it's 90. World Health Organization says 100. A gas stove in your house, if you bake a cake in the oven, we're looking at 230 parts per billion. If you roast meat, 296. If you fry bacon, who doesn't like bacon? Sorry, vegetarians or vegans. 104. Boiling water, 184. The cooktop itself, absent cooking any food on it, can be anywhere from 82 to 300 parts per billion, average over an hour. The gas oven itself, again, not cooking food, between 130 and 546. So your indoor air quality suffers just by using a gas stove. Um, so how does it work? Well, I took these two pictures of my own personal stove. That one, I was cleaning it and I took the little top part off that kind of distributes the gas. So if you don't have that on there, it looks kind of like that. It looks like a vent thing from a refinery or a little fire volcano or something. So you put it back on, it looks like that. The gas basically goes in the tube. You know, there's a spark that ignites it. Uh, the tube carries the flame and the gas down there and then the flame kind of spreads out around the ring. It's fairly simple. Um, they do have some advantages. You turn it off, it's off. You turn it on, it's on. Um, they're a little bit faster than an electric stove, but nothing really beats induction in the speed category. Uh, if you really wanted to, you could roast something on it. Um, and you, but you do want to, of course, use ventilation in any case. They still work when the power's out. Nothing's stopping you from lighting a match and, and lighting it just because the electronic uh, ignition doesn't work if you have one. So they do have that going for you. But um, if you don't already have a gas line, installation can be expensive. Um, and as we try to move away from gas, if your community is one of those ones that's limiting it in new construction, it may not be an option for you. Um, the heat settings aren't exact. It's hard to get the exact same one every time if you're doing something sensitive like that. They are harder to clean. I can vouch for this. Mine is pretty, pretty much usually looks maybe not quite that bad, but mine's typically a mess because I don't like to take the whole darn thing apart and clean it every single time after I cook because I also have to wait for it to cool for a minute afterwards. Um, and again, they're only 40% efficient. Only 40% of the energy that you are using is going to cook your food. So a little bit about electric. So the current 
basically flows through the metal coil, that's the burner, and then that burner becomes hot and glows with the heat, and then it transfers the, the heat to the pot, which cooks your food. Um, anybody who's had one of these knows that just because the burner is black does not mean it's cool. Uh, and if you tell your kid not to touch it because it's hot, they're going to be like, ow, <laughs> because that's what kids do. Um, so they can remain hot for a while afterwards. Yes. Go back. Oh, that is not what I meant to do. I'm sorry. Uh, I guess I need to read this thing. You can't, does it? I think I can. So the coil on the stove is it resistant heat? Yeah. And it does take a long time to heat up. Yep. Which is the same as electric baseboard. Okay. So we encourage people, if you remember what Christine was talking about, to get air source heat pump. Yes. When they have electric resist resistance. Resistance heat because you'll have the baseboard because it's way less efficient. Do you know how what's the difference in efficiency percentages is between a baseboard electric resistance and a heat pump? A baseboard electric is about the same as a coil. Okay. Okay. Because it takes a long time to, to heat, heat up. up. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And you know, one reason that heat pumps are so good is because they basically mm -hmm. take the air out of the room and to get the temperature to what you set for the remote control. The yep. Thermostat. Yep. Whereas this mm -hmm. and oil, boiler, gas furnace, uh, electric baseboard heat all generate heat. To push the energy into the room. Yeah. So it's kind of the opposite, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Which is partly why you can get more than 100% efficiency on a heat pump because it's taking energy that's already there and kind of just moving it around versus using energy to create heat or create cooling. So. All right, so electric stoves, pretty easy and intuitive to use. Um, if you're trying to simmer something on like super duper low heat, you can just shut it off and that residual heat will keep it going. Um, it can be pretty precisely controlled and managed and can help with your energy costs um, if you were, say, converting from a gas stove. And they are up to 80% efficient. It's not a terrible choice. Um, but again, that residual heat can be kind of dangerous. As Jeff just pointed out, they do take a longer time to heat up um, and the coils can kind of have hot spots if it's not a very... Um, even distribution of heat. So, induction. Totally different technology than either of these. Uses essentially magnets. And the deal here is like you can see here, you need a compatible pan. So, this pan, the, both these pans are compatible. So, you can see the ice is not melting next to the boiling water. The stove is only heating up the pan in just that area, nothing beyond it, which is why. The egg is cooking here and not cooking here. So this is kind of a little, it passes the AC current through the induction element, which creates an alternating magnetic field above the element, which heats up your ferromagnetic pot or pan. So the pan picks up the energy and then gets hot. It's not the stove itself getting hot, it's the pan. So just to kind of illustrate, um, a pot on an electric stove, you can see the electric stove is kind of heating up the area around the pan, the whole pan itself, the handle, even the um, sort of the, the back part of the stove a little bit. On a gas stove, same thing. That pan is getting really hot. It's as hot as the flames. The, the what's it called? The grid that it's on is also heating up and you're losing a little bit of heat. Induction. The stove itself is not heating up at all. All it's heating up is the bottom of the pan. That's it. That's how we get up to 90% efficiency with an induction stove. Uh, yeah? Uh, I'm trying to be double that. Go right ahead. Someone that is a cook um, professionally, I love the idea of induction. Yes. The only problem is you're limited to the pans. You are limited to the pans. I do talk about that in a slightly later slide. And the other thing is just the, the drop off the residual heat once you put your whatever you want. And that's my yes. biggest issue with 
production. There's a learning curve. So the first time I tried to make hard boiled eggs, I failed. And I'll tell you why in just a bit. So, but yeah, so the cooking experience is a little bit different. So first of all, it is faster. About two minutes to boil a quart of water versus about eight minutes or so on um, a gas stove or an electric stove. So they are very, very fast. Um, they do make some funky noises. I personally don't find them objectionable, but it sounds almost like a fan kind of noise. They might make a ticking or your pan might make a ticking or a rumbling because if it's got different layers, they expand and contract as they heat at different rates, maybe a buzz. Um, nothing, I, I don't find it irritating. It's not like overly loud, um, but they do make some different noises. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with your unit. Uh, this does not happen. You can't be like, oh crap, did I leave the stove on? Because if there's no pan on it, it will not work. Because remember, you need to have a magnetic pan on it to Andy's point. Not every pan will work. So at the end of our little, my little spiel here, I have four of the pans plus my tea kettle over there and some magnets. So you can see which of these pans that I have will work on my portable induction cooktop and which ones will not? Which ones do I need to resort to the gas stove when I want to use them? Because I, I wind up using that nine times out of 10, but unfortunately the two pots that I use the most are just not compatible. And compatible stuff is kind of expensive, so I'm just not quite there yet. But um, yeah, you won't, if you leave a, once I left a plastic plate of cookies by accident on the electric stove, I turned on the wrong burner, we had a little kitchen fire. Not gonna happen. You put that plastic plate of cookies on this and actually turn on the wrong burner, Nothing happens. Um, so again, if you don't have the right pan, nothing happens. So if you're trying to put it on and you didn't test it, you're like, what is the pan getting hot? That's why. So um, some of the benefits, I think we kind of already talked about them. You're going to improve your indoor air quality, which would also be the, the truth with an electric stove. You're going to lower your greenhouse gas emissions by not having gas coming to your house. Um, they're safer. No gas leaks, they cool down a lot more quickly, so the danger of getting burned on a hot burner that doesn't look hot um, is less. So they are the most energy efficient cooking option. Again, the surface cools quickly, they're faster, safety, they don't, and they don't warm up your kitchen. Um, I find that my air conditioner doesn't need to work nearly as hard when I use the induction cooktop versus the gas stove. Um, there are some disadvantages. Uh, they do require 220 to 240 volts. So if, like me, you have a 100-volt system, you have not upgraded your electrical panel, you can't get one of these. Um, and, of course, if it's gas, you'd have to convert from gas to electric. Again, a portable one doesn't have that same issue. And um, there's, I know I'm not supposed to recommend something, but there is a company called Impulse Labs that's working on some sort of a funky battery one, they're the only company I'm aware of that's doing it, um, so that either you wouldn't need to, I think you wouldn't need to upgrade, and then the state of New York is actually putting it out and having some sort of a contest to which company can develop an induction stove that would require an electrical upgrade. So I'll be very interested to see what they do with that. So for people who want to have a more efficient, sustainable house, yes. electric dryers, Yep. Air source heat pumps yep. and solar all required 220. 220. Yeah, so if you want to electrify your house, you're pretty much going to have to upgrade anyway. Um, and to me personally, the stove is kind of a low hanging fruit because right now, Mass Safe has a rebate on it of, I want to say $540. And a little bit later, if you go to rewiringamerica.com, um, I think it says, whoops, later. Uh, Okay, I don't know why my screen share ended. I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, I think there'll be another $800 later, but don't like quote me on that, um, but I can look that up. Um, yeah, so that's one disadvantage. They're obviously a little bit more expensive, although prices have come down a lot. They have one that's like, I want to say 1100 or 1500 bucks out there. Ah, that's why it keeps me lots of zoom here. Okay. Um, there's my screen share. I 
apologize, folks. Apparently, it's the internet here is not terribly great. You know, there we go. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, again, may not work with your existing cookware, but if you were looking for an excuse to get new compatible cookware, you could use it as one. Um, there is a learning curve. I mentioned that I failed to boil eggs, because what do you, how do you boil eggs? Hard boiled eggs. You turn them in the pan, you turn it on, when it boils, you turn it off and let it sit there. The induction stove boils the water so quickly that you, the eggs are literally not in the hot water for enough time. I, I wound up with essentially soft boiled eggs. Um, so you need to let them boil for like two minutes and then shut it off and let them sit there. So Andy, what were you saying if you put something in the time to reheat the water? It's like the recovery off of, of like the heat. So like okay. if you have a, fully hot, a, a pot of boiling water, yeah. you put your cold food in, yeah. like it's about that recovery stuff. Is so, it? Yes. I, I mean, I believe, because I truly appreciate it, the recovery time is much quicker than Let's say an electric stove. Okay. Induction and we'll still a little green on. Okay. But I think it'd be the same problem where like the, the transfer of heat is yeah. quick. And then recovery time really will dictate the quality of your food supply. Depending mm -hmm. on if you're blanching something. Yeah. The sear, you're searing scallops and say, you need yeah. that heat. I mean that's that's the other thing. Like if you're limited by your pants, you are kind of limiting yourself on what you can do with with what you're cooking. Yeah. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing, okay. you know, induction get a little, a little more robust as far as like quality of pans and quality of burners. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that happening in the house unless you have three phase coming down your, you know, coming down your street, mm -hmm. which might be some other situation. So yeah. Yeah. But I am an environmentalist. Yeah. Uh, so what I, what I believe in what we do is we do electric induction mm -hmm. for our Oven. Yeah. And then we do, unfortunately, we do gas for our stove oven. Yeah. Well, again, there are some people who do not want to part with their gas stoves. If there's and a better a, way to do it, yeah. Do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. so what I'm thinking about doing um, is I I need to work with the library and I keep forgetting this. I want to see if they can get a portable induction cooktop for their library of things, and then people can take it home and play with it. Yeah. I personally bought mine. I thought I was getting one induction cooktop, plus it came with a cast iron griddle. I was on Facebook Marketplace, it was 55 bucks. I get there, there's two of them. And I'm like, whoa, because these things are only 100 bucks a piece. So I bought two new wave induction cooktops and the, the griddle thing for 55 bucks. So you can get them online, and they were new. So, um, you know, there, there are options where if you wanted to play around, you could do it. Maybe I'll just donate one to the library because I only use one of them. We'll see. Um, but, but yeah. Uh, and also, like we saw in the heating slide, it really only heats up the bottom of your pan. So unless the, conduct, the, the conductive cladding goes all the way up, it is only going to heat the bottom. So you do have to be a little careful there. Uh, but there is no evidence. Some people have been concerned about the magnetic field. like. You know EMPs and whatever, and but there are no there's no studies that indicate that there are any sort of health risks. The only limiting factor you might have in that regard is if you have a pacemaker, that could be an issue. They say you don't want to be within three to five feet. And obviously, if you're cooking with it, kind of an issue. Uh, so that would limit you. But if you're at somebody's house and they're cooking, and you're not, you can be in the kitchen. Just don't like be on top of the stove. So, how do you know if your pan is compatible? Well, they make it easy on you. If it has one of those symbols on the bottom, A, B, take a magnet. So, your magnet sticks to the pan. And it should be a nice, strong, like not, not too weak, it should be nice and strong. Then it'll work. If your magnet does not stick to it or it's weak, you might need to replace your pan. Um, so where can you get one and how much? Any local appliance store, big box appliance store. I've seen them from $1,300 up to $6,000 if you want the fancy one that comes in like the aqua blue color with 8 million different features. Uh, if you don't want to buy a whole range or stove yet, you can get the, um, 
the portable ones, like I mentioned. They also make this, this converter thingy, but um, I got smart one day. I was like, oh, well, I don't want to, um, I, I want to use one of my non-compatible pans on the induction burner. So I took one of my, I thought it was fine, took one of my compatible frying pans, stuck it on there, put the pot on, and was completely underwhelmed. Um, and I suspect something similar might happen with these because you're losing, it's basically almost making it like a, it's almost making it like a regular electric cooktop. It takes a long time to heat up. You're not getting the energy savings. So I'm not sure I can recommend that particular option. But it's an option if you wanted to play around but did not have compatible cookware. But you might not be that impressed uh, if you did. Again, okay, so yeah, massive is doing a $500 rebate um, if you switch from gas or propane. So you need to have mass save, verify that you have a gas stove, and then when you switch, and then it'll be up to $840, depending on your household size and income at the federal level. But I don't think that is active yet. I think that's coming later in 2023. So this is just a little chart. I did an experiment. I did this on um, the electric stove at SATV, Salem Access Television, who's here recording today. Thank you very much, Nate. Uh, I did it on my home stove, which gave me a good excuse to give it a thorough cleaning, a gas stove, and I did it on the induction cooktop. So the time to boil was around eight minutes for both gas and electric. The gas power burner got up to about 349 degrees, electric 439. Induction, after I took, took it off, was only at 130. So the burner temperatures at a minute after, we're still at more than 300, more than 400 and 128. But at five minutes is where you really see the difference. We're still over 250 degrees for both gas and electric, whereas we're already down to 120 after five minutes on the induction. Because if you remember the way induction works, it's generating that magnetic field above the unit, above the surface, and heating your cook where. So the only residual heat on the induction surface is the heat that the pot gave to it. So it was cool enough, not like cold to the touch, but down to 120 where you're not really gonna seriously burn yourself after only five minutes, whereas it took almost a half an hour for electric and almost 20 minutes for gas. So that's a big difference. Um, I believe the next slide is just a video of these things happening sped up a little bit, kind of like time lapse. Um, but that is pretty much, I'll just play it while we, Go on. Um, I think it just takes. You're the world's expert on induction. I'm the world. I doubt that. It seems to be. Um, but it is a topic that I'm obviously passionate about, and I enjoy experimenting with things. And I'm a total nerd, um, and I will own that and be proud of it. Um, yes. Uh, do you know if any companies are coming out with big uh, big tops that have a combination of uh, yeah, like a gas or natural gas or propane cooked up like burner? With induction, because I think that's that's well, one way to actually get people to actually well, like get like some burners so are induction. One burner. All you can say, honestly, like every household when you're cooking, you need one burner that is like your power burner. Let's yeah. say that you're Sierra. Yeah. That'd be your gas yeah. burner. Yeah. Everything else would be induction. I think yeah. people get on board with that because like that's how you cook anyways. Like you want to get some. Yeah. I mean, maybe. Oh, it would help if I press the plug. Uh, there we go. This should start. Maybe. All right. Well, if it doesn't go, it doesn't go. Um, but yeah, if you, having said that, so if you want to play around on that, I would recommend that we move, since this thing apparently isn't going to start, uh, I would recommend that we move to the playing around with stuff phase of things. It's 20 after 6, so we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, so I'm going to end the formal presentation part. So if you want to come over and see which other of my cookware is compatible or not, um, I'll boil some water over there just to show you okay, what would, you, you get. Have to take off. You guys have to take off. I want okay. to thank you. You're you welcome. Did a great job, um, Thank you. Yeah. So I, so like, so I guess a little bit about my friend's cooktop, Brugal, and this one. The way they work is you like set the temperature. So it's got. Low, which is 100 degrees, medium, which is 175, or no, medium low is 175, medium is 275, medium high is 375, high is like 
425 and then sear is like 475. So if you put it on max sear, that's where you get the boiling water in two minutes. And um, honestly, I think if you like, I don't know how much difference it makes as to plopping something cold in the pan. I mean, no matter what you do, it's gonna. There's gonna be a heat. There's gonna be a yeah. Um, so like I, I I love the Cook's Illustrated. Um, they have like a science of good cooking cookbook, and they go over all the concepts. And they're like, no, like don't just bring your heat up to room temperature before you sear it. Like heat it up in the oven to like 200, and then sear it so you avoid so. Yeah. Even the infrared uh, description. Of really showed like when it's actually heating it's only the magnetic cook cup mm -hmm. and that's yeah obviously as a cook that's my concern i know that yeah. just from seeing that yeah it's like i got this i gotta like re the recovery is just like oh man yeah i'm all for it i know i'm just like yeah we're gonna beat this far. okay well in that case i'm gonna wrap up and hopefully do the same thing <laughs> awesome. Great job. all right thank